Um, okay. So, Wendy, you are a professor of neuro, neural science and psychology in the Center yes. of Neuroscience at New York University. You received your undergraduate degree in physi- physiology and human anatomy at mm-hmm. the University of California in Berkeley in 1987, studying yes. with Professor Marion C. Diamond, a yes. leader in the field of brain plasticity, which is very fascinating. She mm-hmm. went on, you went on to then earn your PhD in neuroscience from UC San Diego in 1993. So well before I was born, <laughs> you went on to earn, uh, you went on to complete a post uh, doctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health before accepting your faculty position at New York University in 1998. I was two when that happened. Wow. <laughs> God. <laughs> Now I feel uh, now I feel young. <laughs> um, That's major, because you are young. <laughs> yes, <laughs> your major research interest continues to be brain plastic, plasticity. You're best known for your extensive work studying areas in the brain critical for our ability to form and retain new long term memories. That's a I want to touch on that very um, in the in inter- interview because I watched something very fascinating. A friend of mine sent it to me last night, which has mm-hmm. everything to do with memory. So okay. uh, good timing. <laughs> yes. And yes. More, more recently, Wendy, your, your work has focused on understanding how aerobic exercise can be used to improve learning, memory, and higher cognitive abilities in us as humans. You, yes. Wendy, you are passionate about teaching, about exercise, and about mm-hmm. supporting and mentoring up uh, up and coming scientists as well. I'm not a scientist, but I have a fascination for it. I, I failed right. science in school, but uh. <laughs> I still have this appreciation and this fascination for it. You're also a TED talker. You yes. did your TED talk on the brain changing benefits of exercise has over 4.8 million views and counting. And well, I'm, I'm honestly delighted to have you here on the Storybox podcast. Wendy, welcome. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Now, before we get, I guess, touch on all these aspects of, of your life, I have one question that I love asking people to sort of start okay. the conversation, and that is, what is your definition of success? My definition of success is doing something that, that I think about when I wake up in the morning. That, that, that is what I want to do. And that was actually my definition and that helped me determine when I wasn't doing what I really wanted to do, which was something I started, I did really want to do that at some point. And then life changes and interests change. And I realized I was waking up thinking about a different topic area. And this is when I switched from studying the physiology of memory and, and in the hippocampus, part of the brain critical for long-term memory, to studying how we can use physical aerobic exercise and other forms of exercise to enhance our brain, to protect our brain from aging and neurodegenerative disease states. And I just knew that that had the potential to change and improve literally millions of lives and that that is what I, I was passionate about and that's what I wanted to study. So, where did, yeah. Where did this, um, I guess, passion and desire to study, I guess, neuroscience and physiology and the anatomy, where, where did that come from? Yeah, well, it, it came from a very specific experience that I had. I, I can kind of narrow it down to a specific day. So it was the first year of my first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley. And I took a a freshman uh, seminar class, which is a a class with just a few freshmen, 15 freshmen, and a full professor talking about their research area. And I was lucky enough to have chosen, not exactly out of the blue, but I didn't know her at the time. I didn't know her reputation, but I chose the most interesting title, which was The Brain and Its Potential. Mm. And it was taught by Marion Diamond, uh, uh, a leader uh, and uh, just a pioneer in the study of how the environment can change our brains. And so how we live can change our brains. And not only was she is a pioneer and, and an amazing scientist, but she was, and she still is, the best teacher, classroom teacher that I've ever 
had in my whole science career. And so she just kind of sucked us in with her, with her fascinating description of how the brain is the most complex structure known to humankind. And we all have one. Yeah. It wouldn't be fascinating to understand how this works. Mm-hmm. We all have one in our head. And, and, and um, there is actually a profession out there that is neuroscientists that, that is defined by you get to study what's going on in your own brain and, and really understand what makes you you. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's, that's what I want to do. And wow. so. That's incredible. So when you look at the brain and you actually study the brain, what are yeah. some things you actually, or basically how do you actually study the brain? Like do you do experiments? Like do you open up the brain and look how it works or what are some things that you actually do? Yeah. So, um, the work that I've been doing most recently is, uh, I like to start there cause it's very easy to understand mm. and it is, um, um, behavioral experiments. So if you wanted to understand the effects of your outdoor workout on mm. your brain, here's what I would do. I would take you and all of your outdoor exercising friends, and I would give you a whole wide range of tests. I would test your memory. I would test your mood. I would test your focus. I would test your uh, um, creativity, your ability to create things, your uh, ass- associative memory, your working memory, all these things. They would have you do your favorite outdoor workout. Mm. And after you cool down, I'd have, and I'd retest you later. And um, uh, in another equal group of outdoor loving people, I would do that before and after just sitting outside or you know, watching a video outside, doing something non-physical outside. And by doing systematic um, experiments that like that, that mm-hmm. have both a manipulation group that as I'm looking at the effects of exercise, but also a control group. So I can see what's the effect of just being outside because that might be, you know, good for your mood as well, or it might improve other, other things. Um, we can systematically try and understand exactly what that workout is doing. And mm-hmm. I, I take that and I take all of the other experiments that people uh, using animal studies are doing where they can actually go in and look at the molecular changes in particular brain areas, mm-hmm. the physiological changes in the body uh, that, that are affecting the brain. And I put those two things together to mm-hmm. try and figure out, I want to know for me, you know, a rat can, can also benefit from exercise, but I really want to know for me at my age or for you at your age and your fitness level and your gender, what is that optimum workout that's going to make your brain just, just buzz with, with, uh, <laughs> with good energy and good memory and good focus. And so that, that is how I, I address these questions that we're interested in. So I've always wondered why you guys actually use rats mostly to study first, because rats are different to actual human being. Is is that a rats used as sort of like a basis to see, okay, well, this might be possible. Yeah. And then then exactly. we'll use that to, to move on to humans. Right. Right. So rats are actually really wonderful models for humans. Uh, they have all the brain areas. They have all the uh, same physiological responses. Uh, they they differ in one interesting way in exercise in that rats love running. Like people <laughs> were like, eh, well, okay. Well, not. <laughs> but rats, I, I have a colleague. I, I love when she says this. She says, you know, here's the difference between rats and humans. On their deathbed, you know, they're about to breathe their last breath. All rats would try and crawl to the running wheel and just take a few runs around because they enjoy it so much. Humans are like, forget it. I, just leave me alone. I love the bed. I'll just stay here. So, so there are some differences. But, um, but in, in the most important biological, neurobiological, uh, basic patterns, they are the same. So they make wonderful, wonderful models. And they have taught us so much about the uh, physiology and underlying neurobiology of exercise that have turned out to be true and, 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 um, and applicable to humans as well. Mm. So when you actually go about studying this, how do you, how do you like actually make it 
truth or accurate enough mm-hmm. to 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 basically reveal it to the broader public and say, look, yeah, this is facts. That that is uh, that's a great question. So for that, we use um, math and statistics. So you could say, okay, I have my friend. He says working outside is great. He loves it. Uh, and and so that's that's an anecdote that might uh, kind of point you towards a direction. But what you want is a good enough uh, group of people that show it in 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 a quantified way and with a good control group. So it's not just uh, uh, changes other other uh, possible explanations. But uh, there are, that is the experimental method. You are trying to show a causal relationship between one thing, that is brain improvement, and another thing, exercise. Mm. And so um, what, what determines whether we, um, we can publish this and, and say, hey, this is definitely something that, that is happening, um, is determined by statistics and mm. the design of our experiment. Now, no experiment is perfect, so you might think you have a perfect experiment, and others might come in and look at a different angle and do it in different ways, and and that's what's hard about science. You know, it, it doesn't go from one experiment to, oh, it's in the science book, so therefore it's true. There's so many things that have been uh, uh, discovered and then found to be true, untrue, and then you have to re rediscover it. That is the... Um, that is the purpose of science. And, and really, as a scientist, you learn how to question everything. So, mm-hmm. in fact, nothing is a fact. It's, yeah. it, it, it has a lot of evidence in support of it right now. But you never know whether something could come and upend our understanding of something. And, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for chinks in the armor. We're looking for things that could be another explanation. Maybe it's not what we really think. And that's why it takes so long to become a scientist. It, it, mm. it, it's really a lot of practice, a lot of thinking, rethinking, mistakes, redoing, and uh, uh, learning this scientific method. So do you think it's hard to actually be a scientist? Yes, I think it's very, very, uh, uh, it, it's a very challenging profession. And I have a lot of respect for scientists and psychologists and, and those sorts of people because it is a very fascinating field. There's yeah. a lot to it. There's like you've got the surface level, which is what people see, but then mm-hmm. there's like the deeper levels, which is you got to think deeper and ask yourself the deep questions about, well, why is this the case? And let's figure out these kinds of questions that not many people actually think about in the first place, which is, well, how does it pertain to not just one person, but everybody else? And because yeah. everybody else is so different, how can we get a study around or how can we help people that are all different, but then come right. up with a study that, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating. It boggles my mind uh, quite often, actually, because like you said, the brain is incredibly powerful. Yes. And when you, when you look at I guess the surface level, we don't really think too much about how our brain actually works. It's just mm. there and it works. Yeah. And when you look at the actual like neurological pathways of, of an actual brain and emotions, all that sort of stuff as well, have you found that the gut as well also plays a role in, in the brain? Uh, yeah, I have not studied that. So um, the the relationship between gut and gut physiology and gut responses in the brain is a hot topic. Um, it is uh, it, it is supported by a lot of science. There's a lot of interconnections there, and uh, the more people study this, the more people realize what a profound uh, relationship. That is that is not something that I, I've studied directly, but I've certainly uh, um, followed the, the the new and emerging literature on that important relationship. Definitely, but going back to more of what you've studied, which is, I want to I want to talk talk touch on the memory aspect. And yeah. uh, I was watching a video uh, just recently. Actually, a friend of mine sent it to me. Like I said in the beginning, of uh, basically we can't trust our memories because we can implant false memories into our brain. And we believe that that's actually fact. Have you found that with your studies? So, uh, yeah, that is a fascinating area of research. And the way that I would phrase that is that, you know, 
our memories are not like a hard drive on the computer. Uh, mm -hmm. Our memories are not perfect. Um, and yes, in certain situations, uh, a very clever set of psychologists have found that you can implant memories and, and um, uh, with, with certain manipulations, one can come to believe that something that never happened absolutely happened. You, you keep emphasizing this, emphasizing it, and it comes to be true. Yes, that is, that is absolutely true. I don't study that form of memory. I study the basic form of um, memory that allows us to take something that just happened today, my podcast with you, and um, I've never met you before, but now I will remember your face so that if I see you on another Zoom call, I'll say, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> we had a, <laughs> we were, you interviewed me that one time. And um, so, so that ability to take this, this interaction that we'll have for the next hour mm. and in the future be able to come back and say, I remember you. I remember your face and I remember what you asked, what we talked about. Yeah. That is basic long-term memory. We know it's dependent on the structure called the hippocampus. Mm. My, my fascination, early fascination when I first started doing my studies, I was trying to understand how the hippocampus does that. What are the physiological responses of individual hippocampal cells that say, okay, this memory, yeah, you're going to remember that for a long time. But the other one, you know, gone, gone tomorrow, so, uh, just wasn't memorable enough. Now, we know what makes things memorable. Repetition. If somebody asks me, hey, were you interviewed, you know, by, uh, 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 on, you know, on, on uh, what night is this? It's Wednesday night <laughs> and, and we keep coming back to the same podcast and you talked about Chris Helmsworth and, and, uh, and Center and, and it keeps coming up over and over again. Yes, I'm going to remember it. So repetition, not, not so surprising. Um, uh, um, association. If I know a friend of yours or a friend of yours is a podcaster that has also interviewed me or, you know, uh, we start to have more things in common. That will also help me remember you because I have more of a network in my in my long term memory that helps me remember that um, mm -hmm. emotional resonance. If you ask me the most hilarious question in the world that makes me laugh for fifteen minutes straight, I'm going to remember it. Right? Yeah. So, so uh, good and bad. If you ask me a question that makes me cry for 15 minutes, I will also remember that, you know, this, this interview because, because of that question. Um, so, so these are the things that we know um, make memories uh, strong and, and work in the hippocampus. And I was trying to understand that. So what are some things that we can do right now to actually strengthen that part of our brain? So that's a great question. So the hippocampus is very, very unique in mm. a few different ways. Way number one is a way you don't want it to be unique. It is the first general part of our brain that is affected in Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So um, plaques and tangles that basically strangle uh, the living neurons in the hippocampus and end up kill, killing them, they start in the, in the hippocampus. So that's why early signs of Alzheimer's is often loss of your ability to form new long-term memories. Mm -hmm. But on the good hand, the good news is that the hippocampus is also unique for a good reason. It is one of only two brain structures in our adult brains where brand new brain cells can be born. All the other neurons, they're there from when we're born, and if they die for some reason, they're gone. But in the hippocampus, you have the potential to grow brand new neurons uh, that can make the hippocampus bigger and make it work better. And uh, the one, the best way we know to make that happen more, it happens normally, even if you're a couch potato, but uh, the, the way to really make many, many new neurons uh, get born is to exercise. So that's, that's my motivation for exercising. I, I think about all my new baby hippocampal neurons that are, that are starting to sprout out and uh, make my memory uh, as good as it can be. That's, that's fascinating. So even older people are getting past the age of 60, 70, they can actually create more um, hippocampus neurons. Yeah. So there, there's evidence that the ability to have new neurons born does diminish with age. So mm -hmm. I would not guarantee that a 90-year-old grandma will be uh, generating new neurons. But 
generally through most of our life, there is the potential of gaining new neurons. And there've been studies showing that uh, older adults over 65 uh, with a six month exercise regimen where they increase their aerobic exercise, the size of their hippocampus, but not other structures increased in, in correlation with their increased uh, exercise. I met some pretty amazing elderly people that their memories are sharp as a tack. They, yeah. just, they just know everything. Like if you ask them a question and they just will, they'll tell you and they'll actually give you a story to help explain the answer to your question, which yes. is absolutely amazing because at their age, it's like almost like ages against them and they're starting to get into the twilight years of their life where the brain's sort of starting to slow a bit down, but no, they're just like sharp still. And I'm always fascinated yeah. by that. Like what causes that to actually happen? Then you go back to that everyone's different. So everyone yeah. slows at a different rate or speeds mm -hmm. up at a different rate as well. Um, right. that, that's how I see it. But speaking about this exercise aspect of, of our being, when did you find that exercise actually impacts your hippocampus and your neurons? So, um, I, I discovered it as I was kind of, essentially doing an experiment on myself. So mm -hmm. I was a um, assistant professor uh, at NYU working really, really hard to try and get tenure. It's one of the most, you know, stressful periods of my life uh, because basically you're saying, here colleagues, just judge me and you can either fire me or you can keep me for life. And I really hope you keep me for life because if you fire me, I will be humiliated for the rest of my life. So it's like, that's in the back of your mind, but you know, you're, you're trying to, uh, do really good science and, and prove yourself as, as your own independent researcher. And so I was working really hard and had lots of people in my lab and things were going well, except for one thing. I did nothing but work mm -hmm. and I ate a lot of takeout because there's a lot of great restaurants here in New York city. And I ended up gaining 25 pounds, which was really, really bad. And also I was not happy and I was grumpy and I was stressed out because I was worried about getting tenure. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't, and also I, I had no friends and, and cause I was working all the time and I had my colleagues, my lab, but, but you know, not, not social. I didn't have a great social network. And so I didn't know quite how to get new friends, but I did know how to try and lose that 25 pounds. So I went to the gym. So I got a gym membership and I started working out. And um, that, that led me to realize what a profound effect changing that lifestyle, that sedentary um, takeout based lifestyle to a regular exercise lifestyle, how much that affected my whole life. First, my mood was just boosted. I'm sure the people in my lab are like, yeah, keep going to the gym because you're a lot nicer person when you go to the gym. But not just that, my writing. So scientists, you know, I took me a while to learn this. Scientists live and die by their ability to write and write grants and write papers. I, did, I didn't quite realize that. I, I love doing experiments. And I noticed my, my grant writing got better when mm -hmm. I was going to the gym because my memory was better and my focus was better. Mm -hmm. And that's what sent me my own observation that my own memory and focus was better sent me back to the neuroscience literature to say, Hey, what do we know about this? Is this consistent? Is this, you know, do people know about this? And that's when I rediscovered the, the literature um, showing that uh, exercise is stimulating hippocampal neurogenesis. And it also took me back to my, my uh, science mentor, Marion Diamond who didn't initially start study exercise, but she looked at the effects of enriched environments, which was basically a big old cage with lots of rats and lots of toys to play with, where the rats were running around a lot more than the small impoverished environment. And that was one of her breakthrough and groundbreaking experiments showing that raising rats in what I like to call the Disney world of rat cages, mm changes the brain structure. It actually literally makes the outer covering of the brain, the cortex, grow. It gets mm -hmm. thicker. And then later, 
somebody say, hey, what is it about that Disney World of rat cages that makes all those brain changes? Well, all they had to do was give the rats a running wheel, not even any of the toys, just a running wheel. And they got most all of the brain changes. And so I was like, oh my God, I am like one of the rats in Disney World. I've just given my brain the Disney World treatment and I'm, I'm, I'm reaping all the benefits. And so that was really the start of my, of my shift of research. Um, but the other kind of twist that came in is that right at the time that I was noticing all these improvements in my ability to write and my mood improvements, um, my father, uh, my mother called and said that my dad wasn't feeling well and that he had come home one day uh, from his drive to the cafe to get his afternoon cup of coffee saying that he got lost. It's only seven blocks to his cafe that he was going to for the last 30 day, 30 years. Mm. And spatial memory, what is that dependent on? But the hippocampus, which mm. I was a world expert on. So I knew that was very, very bad news. And as I, I got him to a great neurologist and he was diagnosed with dementia that eventually was diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. It, it became clear that all the things that I was noticing that were improving in me clearly went down really shockingly suddenly in him. The neurologist said this usually doesn't happen this dramatically, but we suspect that he had um, uh, uh, what we call cognitive reserve. He was a really smart guy. He, he's passed away now, but uh, he was a really smart guy and he knew how to cover for his, his diminishing memory, cover so badly that he covered so well that one day his brain just couldn't do it anymore. And then we saw, saw all the memory impairment just, just kind of flood out. And so um, that got me simultaneously interested in how, how exercise can be used as, as a brain booster for you know young people 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 my age but also as a protector and a um and a booster for older people as well because my father was suffering from the things that I was improving so mm -hmm. it, it was really a, a a really big important time in my career when when those things were happening speaking about i i'm sorry to hear that your your father's past and what he had to go through as well but speaking about I guess, Alzheimer's disease and dementia as well. Has there been a study around how can we actually prevent it or is there a way to cure dementia and Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me answer the second question first. No, there is absolutely no cure for dementia. Mm -hmm. I believe the figure is 98% of the um, Alzheimer's related drugs have failed. Mm. It is not good for the pharmacy. They have a hard time. They have a very hard solution uh, um, problem to solve. But here's what we do know. Um, two of the brain areas that are most affected by Alzheimer's include not only the hippocampus, which we've talked about, important for long-term memory, but the prefrontal cortex, which is right behind our forehead, and it's important mm. for decision-making, um, what we call working memory, which is keeping things in mind, and uh, um, big aspects of our, our personality, critical part of the brain. And those are the two brain areas where exercise has some of its most dramatic improvements. Um, new brain cells in the hippocampus that can't get more dramatic than that. But in the prefrontal cortex, there's evidence that uh, there is uh, the neurons that are there sprout new appendages, dendrites they're called, as well as their axons get stronger and, and better insulated with more uh, exercise. So in theory, you think, okay, well, if I work out all of my life, I'm going to have a huge hippocampus and a huge prefrontal cortex. That should save me from dementia, at least for a little while, right? It should stave it off. Mm -hmm. Well, there's evidence in support of that. And my favorite study came out in 2018, and it was done. It was a longitudinal study done in women in Sweden. And when these women when, were in their 40s, they asked uh, for these 200, 300 women, what fitness level are you? Are you high fit, mid fit, or low fit? Okay, so they were characterized. 40 years later, when they were in their 80s, they came back to all of these women and asked, 
how many of them passed away, how many of them had dementia, uh, what, what came of this, this group of women that they had characterized as high fit, mid fit, or low fit. What they found was relative to the low fit women, the women that were high fit in middle age staved off dementia by nine more years. Wow. That is incredible, right? Uh, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, I should emphasize, this is not a randomized control study. It is an observational study, and it suggests a direction. Don't, uh, it does not mean that if I become high fit right now that I'm going to get nine years. You know, somebody needs to pay me nine years when I get to my 80s. doesn't quite work that way. But it is consistent with the neurobiology that we know that that in um, strengthening these two brain areas does help to stave off dementia longer. And there are other studies in men only that are also going in exactly that same direction. Mm, Because you can study both men and women and you can see because women think differently to men and men think differently to women. And I think I believe that the neurological pathways are, are different for men and women, which is another fascinating field of study as well. But why do you think that we can't actually cure with all the technology, with all the medicine that we have available at our fingertips today? Why do you think we can't actually cure dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Because it is, um, it, it, I think the short answer is the brain is so complicated. And dementia is not just okay in cell cell fifty eight. It's or in you know a category of cells that we could identify. That's where the problem is. So we can go in and and f- try and target it. Yes, it starts in the hippocampus, but it grows and mm-hmm. it goes out into the cortex, and that's when you start to get generalized dementia and you get the personality changes that happen in in certain forms of uh, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, it is unrelenting it is widespread and um it it, it's just been a very very difficult nut to crack and not only that unfortunately it is at epidemic levels because the age of our populations are going up and um i it's uh it's it's just a very very hard problem so uh i can't say i'm optimistic that we're going to cure it in the near future but I am optimistic that there are there's a lot of very smart neuroscientists oh, yeah. and neurologists that are that are doing their best to yeah. to promote. It's it's That's- um yeah, it's a I've always wondered to myself, well, if we class it as a disease, then can't we cure a disease? But then you gotta think, well, you there's not every, every disease that is out there, you can't always cure it. So you can always prevent it, the long-term effects of it, but you can't necessarily cure it, so to speak. It's like like a mutation and it keeps going and going and going. And if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't exercise, which I've noticed is, is a massive benefit to not only my health, but my cognitive function. I know that if I don't exercise, I know how that affects me in the day. I'm not as yeah. positive. I'm not as mm-hmm. hardworking. Uh, it's weird. And I think the amount of exercise that we do as well also makes a difference. So yes. if we're over-exercising, that makes us tired. That doesn't necessarily make us feel like we can do the best we possibly can in the day because we're so exhausted. So having, yes. I think having the right amount of exercise. So what do you recommend is the right amount of exercise for a person to do? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, and the answer really depends on your individual background. So age is going to matter, obviously. Fitness level is going to matter, obviously. So um, let's try and give an answer that is irrespective of, of those things. So for you, um, the best workout is one that, that taxes you. You, you want to get out of breath. You want to uh, push yourself, uh, but you don't want to push yourself too, too far. Uh, you, it's so funny. Um, a lot of people that join my exercise studies in my lab, 
they're very worried about over-exercising. It's like, what if I exercise too much and, and I hurt my brain? <laughs> and I have to, you know, suppress my smile because very few people can work out so hard. You know, yeah. mostly they drop out because, you know, like one soul cycle class is just too much for them. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, uh, and, and, you know, it's the Olympic athletes that are perhaps more in danger because they push themselves up to that level. They can uh, uh, exercise too much, but really overall the population, very few of us are in any danger whatsoever of exercising too much. And, and what we want to try and do is, is get enough motivation and get enough energy to really push ourselves. That is the workout, the workout that is, uh, uh, aerobic. Uh, and, and I'm also clear, I'm not, uh, people say, Oh, well, you don't, you don't support, um, um, weight, uh, you know, weight bearing exercises. Weight training can increase your heart rate as well. I, mm -hmm. I, in fact, my favorite workouts include both aerobic, but weights that really get my heart pumping. You do some weights with some squats, some body squats. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a really, really good workout. So, um, do something that is, uh, that is, uh, uh, giving you a good workout irrespective. And that goes for the low fit or the high fit person. And that is the, that is the level that you want to get to. That's how you much want to push yourself. And that will get you some of these amazing brain effects that we've been noticing that we've been talking about the mood effects, the focus improvement, the, um, the memory that'll get the, um, what happens is these workouts that, that tax you, that get your heart rate pumping, stimulating a, a growth factor. Mm -hmm. And that growth factor is key for getting those new hippocampal brain cells to grow. And mm -hmm. so that's what you, that's what you want to get to. I'm curious as well, you know, when we, we get tired and we want to, we actually want to sleep, what happens to our uh, neuro um, hippocampals? Well, what happens? Yeah, what happens to that? Yeah, so uh, that has been studied very, very carefully. There is, a, and, and I'm sure you've heard about it, the different sleep cycles, like REM yeah. sleep. REM sleep actually defines, it's not, well, REM stands for rapid eye movement. So when your eyes are closed, the eyes are moving, but it's really defined as a particular pattern of electrical activity in your brain. And the REM sleep is the uh, higher pattern of activity that is closest to wakefulness, but it's one part of a cycle. There's a deep sleep or there's slow wave sleep, and then you come up to REM sleep, and we go through the cycle several, several times during the night, and a good night's sleep is defined by how many full cycles that you, you, you get through. So uh, it, th that is very well defined. It's not like the brain goes blank. There are slow wave uh, areas where the, where the brain is, is less active, but there's also very important parts of the sleep cycle where the brain is very active. I always find it interesting how your brain, it never stops. Like it, yeah. it keeps going, it keeps working. But then again, when you sleep, you don't actually feel anything when when you're sleeping and yeah. it's and then i always find it interesting well how do you actually wake up like what happens when when mm -hmm. you wake up like you yeah. know you yeah. just wake up and you don't actually think all right how did i actually wake up <laughs> <laughs> and it it's it, it always it's puzzling but i know there's like been research and science on that and there's some unanswered questions revolving around that and people yeah. have been studying it for years, years. Yes. And I think sleep is, is very, very important as well as yeah. exercise. So when mm -hmm. you, you do get up and you do exercise, there is a lot of importance that you can. Yes, it's good to exercise, but it's also good to recover and to sleep yeah. as right. well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Very important for brain health. Good yeah. sleep is, is uh, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why I love exercise is that there's so many direct benefits for your brain and your body for exercise, but there's all sorts of indirect benefits. And one of the most important indirect benefits is that the more regularly you work out, the better you, you sleep at night. And I certainly yeah. notice that as well. Same. So <laughs> yes, I usually, I usually get up at around four, four thirty, five o'clock. 
uh, in the morning and I'm usually gone by about eight o'clock, eight thirty at night. So uh-huh. that, that for me and, and all my friends think I'm crazy because I go to bed so early and they're up until all hours of the night, but I know some things and I, and I preach, I preach on this all the time, but if you can get between the hours of eight o'clock to 12 o'clock, that is the best time for your brain to go through this, these waves of healing, cognitive mm-hmm. function, uh, repairing itself. That is the best time for it. That's the deeper side of sleep, which I find interesting because from one o'clock to about four or five in the morning, that's when your brain's sort of preparing to wake yourself up. And it's not the deeper side of things. Cause I noticed mm-hmm. that when it's, when I'm, if I remember getting up at around 11 or 12 o'clock after I've, I've gone, had about two, three hours of deep sleep, mm. I don't feel so good. Mm. But when I get up, for instance, the other night, I got up around one o'clock after I had this deeper sleep and I was able to continue with my day the next morning. So I was up mm. from 1 a.m. till about eight. So up all that time, but I was still able to think clearly. I was still able to go and go. But I notice it if I do the opposite. So if I get up from eleven and then actually go back to sleep around two or or three, mm-hmm. I'm a lot worse. I'm a lot more mm-hmm. tired. I always find yeah. that interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always fascinated with um, when we used to be able to fly to different parts of the world. If you remember that, yeah, you know, time in history, and and just time changes and how hard that is for your body to readjust, especially if you go, you know, from where you are in the world to where I am in the world, that is just such a big change for your, for, for your normal sleep cycles. And you start to realize how important and how entrained we are, um, uh, to these cycles, uh, and, and how, bad poorly your brain is working <laughs> the first few days you're in this new time zone so i've yeah. certainly experienced that more than once uh in I, my actually, travel. I actually have an experience that so it's one thing that i need to experience once coronavirus gives up the ghost um, yes i was actually planning on, on going uh overseas this year but uh alas corona <laughs> so yeah <laughs> but wendy i am very mindful of your time so i do have two more questions for you and that okay. is what are the four best ways exercise benefits your brain? The four best ways. Okay. So number one, I'll go with um, stimulating hippocampal neurons to grow because that will strengthen the hippocampus. It, it affects memory. It also turns out affect certain aspects of mood because hippocampal shrinkage is associated with depression as well. Hmm. But but let's focus on the memory aspect. Number two, exercise strengthens and improves the functions of the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is critical for um, thinking and uh, um, working memory and decision making. That is um, uh, your ability to shift and focus attention, which you use all the time every day for any kind of work that you do, uh, will be improved by exercise. Number three is mood. So um, exercise stimulates uh, the release of dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. Now, anybody who knows a little bit about neurotransmitters likes those neurotransmitters because it means that you're, you're, it's the reward neurotransmitters, it's the feel-good neurotransmitters. These are neurotransmitters that go down in depression, for mm-hmm. example. Well, they go up with exercise. And uh, studies have shown that exercise can be as effective as some, as some of the most commonly used antidepressants to treat major depressive disorder. Now, I don't have major depressive disorder, but I absolutely notice that mood boost uh, with every workout that I do. Uh, and number four will be, um, even though it's last, it might be most important, is that uh, long-term exercise is strengthening and protecting your brain from aging and neurodegenerative disease states. It's, it's what I like to call, I don't know, this is probably not the same in your country, but a 401k is a retirement plan that you put in money a little yeah. while and then you yeah. need the benefits later. So, animation, we call it. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's that for your brain. And so you, you get everything. And, and uh, I, I also just want to leave an image in the, 
in the minds of your listeners. And that is that every single time you work, you move your body, including going on a walk, Mm. you are literally giving your brain the most luscious bubble bath of neurochemicals and growth factors that it could have. Your brain is loving it. And so imagine that every time you move your body and then imagine that over a lifetime mm. and that, that the brain that has been pampered with these wonderful bubble baths of dopamine and serotonin and growth factors, it does better in older age. Mm. And so that, that's what we should all be going for. And um, we need all the help that we can get. So all the programs out there, all the free workouts or even good paid workouts, take advantage of them to get that, uh, that, uh, that pampered brain uh, in old age. If people aren't fit and healthier by this epidemic, because all you can do is spend time at home working out and going for walks and all that sort of stuff, there is something seriously wrong. <laughs> like that literally like they, they it's the perfect opportunity because we don't yes. we have all this time now on our hands and we need to focus on what's most important which is our health you know we yes. take, we, we get too busy sometimes mm-hmm. to actually focus on our health but now we have the the opportunity to actually do it so I, i've been i've been doing uh two exercises or, or two workouts uh, hopefully a day now, which I've noticed the amazing increase in my levels of cognitive function and the way I'm able to think as a result. Because when I'm outside, uh, I, li- I listen to a podcast or I'm just thinking about certain things, not mm-hmm. whether in my life or a, or a deep topic. And I'm always asking myself questions, which yeah. just gets the brain moving. And I notice that I'm able to unlock yeah. certain things in my brain that never knew existed <laughs> before. <laughs> Um, which, is, which is all, all fascinating, Wendy. So I really appreciate your time. My last question for you is, mm-hmm. I call this the legacy question. So okay. you've reached the age of 100. You've done every single study that you can possibly do. You've done everything that you've ever wanted to do in life. And you've reached the pinnacle of, of your career. Your friends have created for you a mixtape of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how they got it. They just did. And they've wow. shown it to you. <laughs> yeah, I love saying that. They've shown it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that mixtape to say and to show about your life? Um, um, what do I want that mixtape to say and show about my life? I wanted to say that that the work that I did really made a difference for strengthening and protecting people's brains, that, that this work has led to changes in how we think about exercise, how we implement exercise, how exercise is promoted by our governments mm. and our schools, and that it's not just, you know, um, uh, a side thing that, that, you know, if you happen to be interested in exercise, okay, go for it. Mm. No, this is something that is integrated in our schools. It's integrated in our education system. It's integrated in our workplaces. Mm. Um, not just have this, this uh, um, gym membership, and that's my wellness program, but, but uh, uh, encompassing uh, policies that make it easy for you to incorporate more and higher levels of workouts. And hopefully with some of the work that I'm doing, workouts that can be quantified. So it's not just, so I think it's doing, but, but here we've shown that this is the level of workout that will improve your mood and your, your focus and improve your memory. Um, so that is what I want the mixtape to show. And, um, uh, um, and I wanted to say, Wendy really loved the brain. <laughs> well, well, that's awesome. I absolutely love that. Wendy, thank you so much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. I've really enjoyed actually speaking to you. And I, I wish I had more time to ask you more questions. This is something that I am very fascinated by. And it, it must be a part two. <laughs> okay. Maybe one, one okay. time. So I uh, really do appreciate you. Thank you for coming on the Storybox podcast. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it.
Absolute pleasure.